morning. So, Aaron has a lot of faith, and we know that because I am standing before you up here today to preach. So, he has left us, Scarlett has left us this weekend, and Darren and I are in charge. How does that make you guys feel? <laughs> Amen. Well, this morning, I have a message, and I've entitled it, The Mission of Ministry. Uh, whenever Aaron had originally asked me to preach, he, uh, he told me that it would be a good idea for me to kind of share a vision for the student ministry here, because that's what I do. I'm the student minister here. So when I was working on this, I started thinking about it. And this is very much out of my comfort zone to preach, because normally whenever I preach, I am more of an expository type of preacher. I want to look at one passage, and I want to dissect it, and I want to get all the details out of that one passage that I can. And, 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 and bring it out. But the nature of this type of message is going to be more of a topical one. Now, I believe God can use both, but this one is a little bit uncomfortable for me. So we're going we're gonna to look at this. We're going to get through this stuff together. But so I thought that the best way to start this was to look for the mandate of youth ministry. And I have some statistics that I want to share. Uh, I mean, these don't come from scripture, obviously. They come from uh, different websites and articles that I found. The first one is that 1,439 teens in the next 24 hours will attempt suicide. This is the second leading cause of death for people between ages 10 and 24. And then also more teens and young adults die from suicide than from heart disease, AIDS, birth defects, pneumonia, influenza, cancer, and lung disease combined. Now that makes sense because typically your, your people in that age group are going to be healthy enough not to experience those things as much. But the sad fact is suicide is, is worse than those things for our teenagers. Four out of five teens who attempt suicide give warnings, but often those warnings are missed or ignored. The next one is, in the next 24 hours, 2,795 teenage girls will become pregnant. Three in ten American girls will get pregnant, pregnant at least once before the age of 20. And that's nearly 750,000 teen pregnancies every single year. 15,006 teens in the next 24 hours will use drugs for the first time. So every four minutes, four minutes, a teen is arrested for an alcohol-related crime. And every seven minutes, a youth is arrested for a drug crime. 3,506 teens will run away. Most of these are due to family problems. They could be physical or sexual abuse. They could be mental health disorders of a family member, um, substance abuse and addiction problems. These problems can be their own or they can be the problem of another family member and also parental neglect. And lastly, two teens in the next 24 hours will be murdered. The homicide rate for, for teens and young adults is the highest group among any other group that we have. So these statistics are nothing to be proud of. They're nothing that makes us feel good about ourselves or nothing that makes us feel good about our country as a whole. But these are just teenagers and they're trying to survive. Now, they, they are doing the best they can with what they have. They are trying to get through this life, but they're trying to get through it alone. They don't have a savior or they don't know the savior. They do have one. They just don't know it. Um, and so what the mission of youth ministry is, is to try to reach not only these teenagers, but even the ones that have good family homes. No matter how good their circumstances around them are or how bad they are, everyone needs a savior. So then what is the biblical mandate for student ministry? It's, it's funny you should ask because really there's not one. And I'm not trying to preach myself out of a job this morning, I promise. There is not a mandate for student ministry. There's not a mandate for children's ministry. There's not a mandate for college ministry. Sorry, Darren. There's not a mandate for adult education ministry. There's not a mandate for senior adult ministry. So why do we have all of these things? What is the mission of ministry? Let's open our Bibles and let's read Matthew 28, 16 through 20. And we can stand for the reading of God's word. And I'm reading for the NIV this morning. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain, where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and he said, 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Father, you come, we come before you, God, and I just pray that you would, you would expose things from your words to our hearts, God. You would, you would show us what this mandate for ministry is, what this mission of ministry is. And Lord, that we would be good stewards. And Lord, I pray that you would speak in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So the background from this passage, I am going to try to work on this passage. Um, Jesus had endured the weight of all the sins of the world, just like he said he would. And then he died, just like he said he would. And then he was resurrected, just like he said he was going to be. So he was resurrected, and an angel told the disciples prior to this to go to Galilee, and Jesus was going to meet them there. So they did. So Jesus was going to meet them there, and he had something to tell them. I don't know about you guys, but I don't have anything stored up, either in here or in here, that I'm waiting to die before I tell somebody. I'm just not waiting. It's not, there's nothing I have that's that important. But Jesus had something. He could have told them anything. He could have told them to make sure that their seventh grade students wore deodorant every day. He could have told them uh, to make sure that you invest all of your extra money so that your future is, is set, that, you, that you're prepared for the future. He could have told them, make sure you never raise any Democrats. He could have also told him, make sure you never raise any Republicans. But he didn't say these things. Instead, he tells them something so important that he, 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 he says something that he's saved until after he's been raised from the dead. And he says that this is the mission. This is the commission for discipleship. So the goal for all of these ministries that I mentioned earlier, student ministry included, is that we would produce disciples. And if we're not doing those things, if we're not doing this in those ministries, then our ministries are ineffective, and we have to examine why. So I have a definition of discipleship, but it's not the one that is on the slide. The long definition I'm going to go through real quick is uh, I'm going to use some verses as references that you can write down if you want to. The first one is that in Luke 9, 23, Jesus tells us that a disciple is a Christ promoter and not a self-promoter. Disciples deny themselves for the sake of Christ. And then in, Luke, in uh, John, 31 and 30, John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus tells us that we can know if we are a disciple if we hold to his teaching in our lives. So disciples are obedient to Christ. In John 15, Jesus tells us that the disciples will abide in him and, they, and the spirit will produce fruit in their lives. So disciples bear fruit. In John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus tells us that the main evidence of us being a disciple is that we love one another. And then here in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, he tells us that we are his witnesses. So the short definition is on the screen. So a disciple of Jesus is a worshiper, a servant, and a witness on mission to tell his good news. There is actually no option between being a non-believer and being a disciple. There's nothing in between those two categories. See, whenever God calls us into salvation, he doesn't just stop anybody right there. With conversion, there is always discipleship. You cannot have one without the other. That's just not what Jesus taught. So I ask you, with all the love in the world right now, before we move any further, are you really a disciple of Christ? Do you really belong to him? Did you fall captive to one of these easy believism uh, false gospels uh, that, that says, hey, you just, you just receive this gift and then you take it back home with you and you continue life normal as usual? The power of Christ transforms us. And if we have not been transformed by his gospel, then our conversion probably wasn't true. So we have defined what a disciple is, and in our passage today, we are told to make more. Now, this phrase, to make disciples, could also be translated to win disciples, because we know we don't make anything, right? We, we, are, we do not have the power within us, on our own, to make any disciples. 
but Christ, through the Holy Spirit, empowers us to do so. And whenever we uh, are, are competing in a, in a race, so to speak, because that's what Paul talks about, even when we do our part in, in the effort, we, we win the race, we don't give ourselves the reward. The reward comes from someone else. In this, in this respect, when we put our effort into discipleship and evangelism, God is the one who rewards that with making more disciples through all of this. So the first question I have for us to see if we are making disciples is, are we bringing the gospel to the lost? Verse 18 says, go and make disciples. Go and win disciples as you are going. Make disciples requires, making disciples requires evangelism. I have an illustration that I have summarized from an author named Alvin Reed. He compares modern church evangelism efforts to a group of fishermen. So he says that there were streams and rivers all around these fishermen, and the fish in those streams and rivers were hungry. Week after week, years and years, these fishermen would meet and talk about their call to fish, the abundance of fish, and how they might even go about fishing. They met every year after year to decide exactly what fishing was, they examined it, and they defended it even as an occupation. They made slogans, they hosted special events nationwide to discuss fishing, to talk about new equipment and baits for fishing. They even spent huge amounts of money on programs and provided surveys to see what types of fish were in those streams and rivers. They even started doing nice things for the fish. Eventually, some even caught two fish. There was one guy that caught two fish from actually fishing. The problem was he quit. He had to quit because he was being beckoned from all over the country so that he could tell how he caught those two fish. So he, he, was t he had to quit. So these people knew all about fishing, but they had never used what they knew for fishing. And my fear, along with Mr. Alvin Reed, is that we know a whole lot about witnessing. We know a whole lot about evangelism because we talk about it so much. We have so many Bible studies that are meant to equip us to do God's work better than we have been in the past. We have so much knowledge that has been passed on to us from big names, uh, but we never use any of it. God's call for us is evangelism. One of Christ's calls we talked about earlier, John 13, 35, he says, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Now, our love for one another is backed up by gospel sharing. Jesus Christ is the ultimate form of love. We see that repeated over and over again in Scripture. But if we are trying to show people love without showing them Jesus, we're not really showing them love at all. And our actions in our community can also hinder people from responding to the gospel. Now, this is where I want to tell you in all the love in the world that the truth is sometimes painful. And I had no intention of hurting anybody's feelings or stepping on anybody's toes, but sometimes God's intentions are different than mine. So I want you to hear everything else that I have to say here with love, through, through the lens of love. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 8 through 11 says, So we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each other each of you as a father deals with his own children. So here Paul was reminding the Thessalonians that it wasn't only about the gospel that they were presenting. The goal was that their lives would back up their gospel. And if that community that they were in, if that community heard their gospel message, but saw actions that were far from Christ-like, it would have hindered the spread of the gospel in that community. And here today in Swartz, this area, Monroe, West Monroe, however far out from this church you live, if we say that we are gospel-centered, if we want to be a gospel-centered church, but 
but we, we, we jump down the throats of anyone who causes us an inconvenience, any coach, any teacher, any administrator, any restaurant worker, any gas station employee. If we are, are jumping down people's throats, we are hindering the gospel from being spread. And there is no way that we are going to be an effective church unless our lives back up our message. Satan has used this hypocrisy from those who profess Christianity, but they don't back it up with their actions over and over, time and time again. And it's one of his best tools. So don't let yourself fall into that category. Another thing we, we, we usually talk about when the question of love comes up is what about uh, social ministries, service projects, random acts of kindness, those kinds of things. Isn't the church called to meet the physical needs of those around us? And I would tell you today that it would not be loving to see somebody hungry and not give them food. It would not be hungry to see somebody that had another type of need and not try to meet that physical need. But it would also not be loving to meet that physical need and then to move on with our lives. There's a deeper need and if we truly love people, we're going to try to meet that need. That's the spiritual need. Social needs and providing services may be an avenue to evangelism, but these alone are not evangelism. Evangelism is actually vocally telling people the gospel. I've heard a quote that I'm going to probably butcher because I didn't put it in my notes. But it says something to the degree of preach the gospel and use words if necessary. I want to tell you that's not true. That's not a good quote. Because there is no way to share the gospel without vocally using words. You can do nice things for nice people, but atheists can do nice things for nice people. People need to know and they need to hear that you have Christ in you and you need to tell them vocally. There's no way around it. So are we bringing the gospel to the lost? The second question I have is, are we making disciples, Christ-like disciples, who love God and one another? The next part of that verse, in verse 20, or not passage, he says, uh, teach them to obey my commands. This also means teach them to follow me. The Great Commission is not just about making converts where we just leave people where they were, like when we present the gospel, but we have to invest in them. We have to be intentional. Uh, discipleship has kind of become the curse word in modern day Christianity because nobody wants to do it. We don't have time. We're too busy. Uh, we're doing good just to get five minutes to talk to somebody. The type of discipleship that Christ calls us to do requires intentional investing in other people. It, it requires relationships outside of your normal relationships. And it also requires us to put ourselves in the presence of the lost. I have, I have seen many students make this, uh, this misunderstanding that, you know, whenever we become saved, when we become Christians, that we isolate ourselves and we keep ourselves away from the lost so that they, there's no way they can influence us. If that was the reason, or if that was the way we were supposed to live, why would Jesus Christ show us the example of going and meeting with the tax collectors and eating with them and fellowshipping with them? They were never his disciples per se, but he did expose himself to them. And so we have to make sure in our lives that we're not casting people out because they're lost. We have to make sure that we're giving them access to us so that they can hear the gospel in their lives and hopefully not remain lost. Romans 6, 3 and 4 says... Or you don't know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We are therefore buried with him through baptism to death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. Now the first step in obedience to this gospel is baptism. And we do that pretty well as Baptists. I mean, we do. But also we're, able to, we're supposed to teach them all of the commands that Jesus taught. We're supposed to show them who Jesus is and encourage them to grow in him. And you say, well, you know what? I don't know what those commands were. I don't, I don't feel like I have enough knowledge to disciple somebody else. I don't really know what to do. 
Jesus summarized every single of the 613 commands of the Old Testament into, into one statement. It's in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. He said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on to these two commandments. Are we making Christ-like disciples? Are we investing in people who are new to the gospel? If we're not, we're doing kind of what Jesus said when he said that the, that the sick need the doctor, the healthy do not. If we are not making disciples and we're only continuing to socialize with our current friends who are Christians, we are being like the doctor who only sees the healthy. We have to be ready to love other people. The last question I have is, are those Christ-like disciples making more Christ-like disciples? So this is the fruit of discipleship. Christ-like disciples make more Christ-like disciples. Those who repent were meant to go and tell others to repent, who were then meant to go and tell others to repent, and so on and so forth. It's supposed to be a cycle. That's the purpose Christ had in discipleship, in this great commission that we're looking at today. It's the process of multiplication. And each of us in here today are a process or are a result of that process. We are all here today because somebody invested in us. We can't stop that chain. We can't just say we're good with what we've got. We've got to keep on bringing that message out there and make more disciples. Paul put it this way in uh, in 2 Timothy 2.2. He said, The things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Now I want you to notice in that verse there are actually four generations of disciples You have Paul, and then you have Timothy. Praise God, we don't have to all be Pauls or Timothys. You also have the people, that the witnesses that that Timothy was going to teach. And then you have the faithful men who would teach the, the next generation after that. You're not functioning as a true disciple unless you're seeking to make other disciples who will continue to try to make more disciples. This requires imparting people what you already know about Christ. It it means that we've got to walk with them as we walk with Christ. And it's not just a one-way street either. We're not the we're not the only ones that are supposed to cause the benefits to happen. And in Romans chapter one, Paul said that he wanted to impart some spiritual wisdom to uh, the people there. But then he also added Romans 1 uh, 12 and he says That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. So even Paul, with all of his uh, passion, all of his knowledge, all of his influence, I mean, this guy was like a super apostle, right? And, And he knew that he would be encouraged by being around other disciples. So we, we grow with, to Christ whenever we are around more disciples. We also grow closer to Christ whenever we are encouraged by each other's faith. So are we making disciples who make disciples? So we've looked at the mission for all ministry. Now I feel like I can, I can justify the uh, kind of vision for student ministry. And so my vision is simple. All I want is for God to bring about discipleship in our student ministry that brings about effective evangelism in their schools. I want our students to be able to to get into their campus and and make a difference for the kingdom of God. Now there are several ways that that this can happen and there are several needs that student ministry would need. Uh, There are three points of applications that I have for parents today. And that's, that's the, the lifeblood of student ministry is actually parents. You may not know that, but it is. And so the first thing I have is expose your students to the things of God. For a student to receive Christ and grow in him, they have to be exposed to the very things that promote Christ. We live in a world where teenagers are exposed to all types of darkness. 
Not just every day, but even hourly every day. It doesn't matter what school they go to. Uh, even in the private Christian schools, they still have darkness presented to them every day. There is not a school that is good enough, even though we have some great schools in this area, that, that can get away from that. And so we have to make sure we are intentionally putting them in places and in things that will promote Christ. I read a book the, uh, last semester called Sharing Jesus Without Fear. And uh, one thing that I learned from it is uh, the author said it takes, on average, six to seven times of hearing the gospel while intentionally listening with no interruptions for people to either respond negatively or positively. And there are some students that have not been in anything we have done seven times since I've been here in, since August. And those students, most of them, are the ones that are not old enough to drive themselves. So that tells me something sort of alarming, that we're promoting other things in our homes besides the things of God. We are trying to make them better at being worldly teenagers than we are to make them be Christians for God's kingdom. We have to make sure we're exposing them to the things of God. Self-promotion is not what God had in mind for us. My heart is that all of our students would be successful in life. But I do want them, when they get there, to be holding the name of Christ up high instead of their own. I also know that church is not the only way for a person to be exposed to Christ or to learn to live for him. But then I have to ask, if we're not exposing our students to things of God at church, then what are other methods are we doing? Are we putting in the extra effort at home or are we bringing them somewhere else other than church where they can be exposed to the things of God? If we're not going to put them in the things that are happening in the student ministry, what exactly are we going to do elsewhere that is going to promote Christ in their lives? So I say again, expose your students to the things of God, that they may become disciples, and then they may make more disciples. The second thing for parents is engage by serving in ministry. One of the key uh, principles of discipleship is service. And i got to say that we do that pretty well here. Every time that we need people to serve, we are, we always, there are always people willing to do that. But there is a ministry for you to plug into if you do not have one that you're plugging into on a weekly basis. It's not just student ministry, there's children's ministry. We are always needing volunteers to do things, if for nothing else, just to love on the students we have. Don't just see these things as, as uh, ministries that only your child can be a part of. There are tons of ways you can help. And also, God will bless you and grow you uh, while you're serving in these types of ministries. And I'm a testament to that because I've been serving in student ministry, you know, volunteering for the past probably five years. And God has done nothing but bless me for it. I have grown in him because of it. The third application for parents is exemplify a godly life at home. Church should not be the spiritual defibrillator. Now, I worked hard to make sure I said that word right. That is the device they use to shock you back to life, for those of you who don't know. Sometimes we look at church and we say, all right, I'm going to just go Sunday and then the rest of the week I'm going to be in total darkness. And then spiritually, you know, I'll get... I'll get shocked back into life on Sunday morning again. And then it just kind of maintains this low, almost dead spirituality in our lives. That's not, what, that's not what the church is for. The church is actually supposed to come alongside what is already going on at home. And so do intentional things with your, with your family. We all have families. Read scripture together. Do a family Bible study together. Pray together. There are so many things that you can do to promote discipleship at home. And I can tell you that you are making disciples. They just may not necessarily be the ones that Christ was talking about. And I say that just because I know that I have some students that like to talk about other people. There's a good chance they pick that up from somewhere. I have students that, uh, that, that tend to be motionless in church. There's a chance they pick that up from somewhere. See, you are making an impact on them. Make sure that that impact is coming straight from God's word. 
So in closing today, I have a quote um, from what is the mission of the church? And he says, in the end, the Great Commission must be the mission of the church for two very basic reasons. Is there something, there is something worse than death, and there is something better than human flourishing. The something worse than death is to spend eternity in hell. And the thing that's better than human flourishing is to have eternal life. So if we know that there is a way to eternal life, and we also know that there is another way to eternal damnation, how much do we have to hate somebody not to share that news with them? Pray with me. Father, we come before you, God, and I just pray more than anything else that you would use this church to bring disciples to your kingdom. Lord, we know that you ultimately control all who would come to you because you are sovereign. But Lord, we have to respond to your gospel and we have to respond in obedience. Lord, disciples, obey your word. And I pray that we would get over our fears of rejection, our fears of uh, not having enough knowledge to be willing to share your, your gospel with other people. Lord, I pray that we would share our stories, if nothing else, about how you've changed our lives. Lord, I know that you have the power to make great things happen in our area, but I also know that we have to be willing. And God, I pray that we would be. Lord, I pray if there's somebody here today who does not know you, that God, you would draw them to you, that you would show them what discipleship really is within our church. God, that, that even those who, who may have walked an aisle at one point in, them, in their lives and, and, and said a prayer, God, you would show them today that, that, is, that there's more to it than that. Your call is a call to die to ourselves and to live for you. And God, if we have not followed you, there's probably a good chance that we, we never made that, that commitment to you. And I pray that you would just draw those who have been tricked into a different type of gospel to you this morning. Lord, I pray for those of us who have been saved for years, God, that you would renew a passion to reach other people. Lord, I pray we would get out of our comfort zones of just talking to our friends and trying to hang out with people that we've known for years. Lord, that you would put us in the presence of new people, new relationships, more, more opportunities to share your, your word and be obedient to the, what you've called. Lord, I just pray that you would speak to us during this, this time of invitation. And Lord, that your will would be done in Jesus' name. Amen.